please welcome to the main stage, Ralph Langner. <laughs> What you see on the screen is the first Death Star. <laughs> and uh, thought to be invincible, it was destroyed by a small fleet of ill-equipped attackers. How was that possible? As the story goes, the attackers had managed to steal the design plans of the Death Star, analyze them to discover a critical vulnerability. In hindsight, that critical vulnerability seemed almost trivial and obvious. It, as you know, it was a ventilation shaft leading directly to the core, and all you had to do was drop photon torpedo. And you didn't even need uh, your target computer to do that. The, the pilot in command did it just by feel. So, such a trivial vulnerability, how come that the Galactic Empire didn't spot that during the construction of their star? That's interesting. Similar thing happened at... Uh, this facility. This is the Natan Fuel Enrichment Plant in Iran. Also heavily guarded and uh, almost thought to be invincible. As you can see, they had anti-aircraft uh, uh, missiles at the complex. They had an air gap to protect their cyber systems, but still attackers managed to, uh, to destroy a couple of centrifuges. How was that possible? Obviously, because they did something very similar, they studied the design plans. So what I'm interested in is what is the method that has been used? Because we need to understand that method in order to protect our most critical systems against cyber-physical attacks. Certainly, the attackers, they, they have no choice. They need to uh, to follow such a method in order to identify critical vulnerabilities. Which, as I said, in hindsight, always look trivial and obvious. And, uh, however, if you want to um, discover what a critical vulnerability is without an accomplished cyber attack, then it is much more difficult. So what do you have to do? What is the analytical process that you have to go through? And uh, just for the purpose of my talk, I'll um, discuss nuclear power plants uh, for a couple of reasons. First, they are also heavily defended. Uh, cost of consequence can be disastrous. And uh, just for example, in, in, in respect to the defense, um, when you think about a physical attack, when you try to physically attack a nuclear power plant at some point in time, you will be stopped by lethal force. And then they also have air gaps. And uh, they even have regulation um, that tells asset owners how to protect against cyber attacks. So in the United States, you need to follow that regulation. You need to get compliant. Otherwise, you risk losing your operating license. And th that whole regulation in the US is based on the idea that existing safety systems, security systems, and uh, emergency prote protection systems are sufficient to cope against any type of attack, including cyber. So therefore, US regulation de requires that you protect your safety systems against cyber attacks, and then you're good. And that's an assertion that I'm going to challenge. Uh, before I do that, let's look at some concepts. I, I want to define here, before going ahead, what a critical vulnerability is. So, in my um, definition, it's a design feature that, if exploited, jeopardizes the victim's capability to prevent unacceptable consequence. And I think two uh, items are noteworthy here. Unacceptable consequence is a policy decision. It's not a technical feature, it's a policy decision. You, as the asset owner, uh, de decide what is unacceptable. For example, in a nuclear power plant, that would be radiological release. Uh, in a food and beverage plant, it could be manipulation of your product. And the, the other thing that's noteworthy is that um, it's not about preventing disaster from happening, that's not enough because uh, you also need to make sure that your defense still remains intact. So you must not allow to come into a situation where um, uh, disaster is no longer under your control. So you're practically disarmed, you're defeated. And therefore the threshold is a little bit lower, it's, it's below accomplished disaster. And um, 
in nuclear as well as uh, in other industries where there is a risk of life and limb, the last line of defense is safety systems. And what you see on screen is, uh, are some of the core concepts of safety, like diversity, redundancy, component failure, etc. And the, uh, again, the, the philosophy is that this is enough to prevent disaster and even to run into criticality. Unfortunately, all of those systems do not factor in malicious activity and they certainly uh, are insufficient against cyber attacks. Why is that the case? That's a conceptual problem. Because when you think about cyber, you have to deal with digital compromise that's very different from random component failure. And you also need to think about coordinated malicious control. So if you think about, if you imagine an attacker has fully compromised all your ICS systems in a plant, and they can do whatever they want to do, then your safety systems will not save you. Why is that the case? Let's look at some of the key concepts, redundancy and diversity. Uh, as everybody in this room knows, redundancy is nothing for a cyber attacker because once that I have my attack code ready, I don't care if I'm attacking uh, uh, one pump or, or 50 pumps because all I need to change if, if, they're, if I'm talking about a redundant system is the addressing. So everything else of the attack code is identical. That, that's, that is no problem for me. And why would I uh, limit my attack? My, why would I limit my targeting to just one of those redundant protection systems or whatever they, they might be? And um, if you think about diversity, uh, here, here's the catch. Diversity reduces risk by random component failure by two orders of magnitude. But if you think about a cyber attacker, it's just plus or minus one. It's incremental. So for the cyber attacker, it's just another challenge, just another system that they need to compromise, etc. It's not exponential. And that's a problem. And uh, when, finally, when you think about probabilistic risk, that's a very um, important concept in safety, uh, where um, safety uh, experts try to um, calculate the probabilities of uh, initiating events and put them into perspective against the risk. Well, usually when you think about nuclear, for example, you're considering events that occur once every couple of thousand years. Well, that doesn't make sense in cyber. But here's the fact. Uh, we are using digital control and safety systems now for roughly 50 years and already have one sophisticated cyber attack against a nuclear facility on the record. So the time frames are completely different. Nobody will be able to tell you this design, this protective design uh, will keep cyber attackers away for a thousand years. Obviously that's nonsense, that's not going to happen. Um, so that leaves some opportunity for cyber attackers, the conceptual limitations of safety. And how do we identify those opportunities? How do, I, do we identify those critical vulnerabilities? Well, I believe it's, in a nutshell, it's a heuristic challenge. I um, think of this challenge like a maze. And uh, the problem is, some of the exits of that maze lead to disaster. For example, radiological release. How do we find them and how do we identify the pathways that lead to those exits? If you think about those pathways as um, uh, digital communication paths like network connections, like uh, uh, protocol communications, and also factor in physical dependencies. And I'm going to discuss those in a detail in a couple of minutes. Now, it has often been said that a hacker, once inside such an environment, could do anything. I believe that's correct only uh, to some extent. So if you imagine a hacker inside that maze, well, probably the hacker is actually able to move into any direction. Okay, let's take that for granted. But the hacker will never find those exits. That's lead, that leads to disaster. I view it as the same uh, uh, problem like uh, you, give, you give a monkey a typewriter and theoretically that monkey could produce a poem, but it's never going to happen. 
So how do we uh, tackle that heuristic challenge? I think we, we need to, to step out of that, out of that maze and uh, view it, let's, let's just say, with a bird's eyes view. So let's take it from conceptual to technical. Here is something similar like that maze, but it more closely resembles an actual environment. So um, below that bar, which is the cyber-physical barrier, you would see a couple of ICS components. Uh, you would see PLCs, engineering stations, HMIs, etc., and the digital communication pathways be, be, uh, uh, amongst them. And the, the interesting point is what you probably didn't see before. On top of that cyber-physical barrier, uh, I have also um, indicated physical systems that are controlled by those components like the PLCs. And those physical systems have their own dependencies. They have uh, physical dependencies. And now here is, here is the point. Every cyber physical attack scenario in, uh, or, or the problem, the, the, the consequence that is associated with, with any of these scenarios is always tied to a physical component to a physical object and that's where we should start so let's just assume from those physical objects on top of that cyber physical barrier we positively know by our safety analysis there are these two physical objects that that really cause a whole lot of trouble if not disaster when malfunctioning or failing so these are all critical physical systems and from there, we can identify other physical systems that they depend on, like support systems, like cooling, ventilation, etc. And certainly, we can also, also work our way down to the digital systems that control them, that monitor them, etc., that send commands. I'll get into detail in a couple of minutes how we do that. And once we have identified those associations, we end up with critical penetration paths that we can take a closer look at. And certainly, as the defender, we would want to break those penetration paths. Now, what you see here is simply a, a graphical uh, rearrangement. Once that we have identified those <coughs> paths and system groups, we can just sort out the irrelevant stuff that cannot in any way manipulate the critical physical objects. Now, let's go through this process again in a little more detail. So we do the very same thing again. We start with identifying the critical physical systems and then walk our way down to the critical digital systems. The first step is to map unacceptable consequence to specific physical plant objects and conditions. I need to, once that I have identified what is unacceptable consequence like radiological release, I can then identify any of those physical components where it could actually happen because it's not every single machine, not every pump that you have, uh, that you are using in, in such an environment. Now the fact is, when, when we are doing this for anything, for any plant where I'm talking about safety risk, then most of this work is accomplished already. And most of this work uh, is all also published already. It's open source. It's in the safety analysis. Let me explain that by referring uh, to examples from the nuclear industry. So for example, uh, you will be able to, um, uh, to look up documents by the IAEA on the internet. And they talk about accident analysis. They talk about all the bad scenarios. And also the NRC has published a whole lot of design, what, what, what is called design control documents that go into the specifics of adverse conditions that must be prevented. Now let's uh, take a closer look how that looks like. So for example, in those NRC design control documents, uh, you will find details on what they call accident analysis. So, where, uh, what are the scenarios that could actually cause trouble and then the designer of the specific plant, like ABB or Westinghouse, they try to demonstrate that no matter what, the, the facility, the plant is still safe. So, so the safety, the safeguards are able to cope with the situation. 
let's go into even more detail. Um, I have picked up one scenario that uh, I think um, uh, allows me to illustrate the, the problem and, and the potential solution fairly well. Um, many of you, or I, I would think all of you know, that um, it's always a, a cause of trouble when a nuclear reactor overheats, okay? Um, but that's not the only uh, critical situation. So another problem is when you cool down the reactor too quickly. And then you can, but by doing that, the reactor, is, the reactor is going to be overpowered and that can result in a reactivity condition. So this is a very well-known problem uh, by nuclear safety engineers and uh, here is how it goes. The, the risk or the problem at hand is that you need to prevent that uh, the, the coolant in the reactor core is cooled rapidly. How could that be possible? Well, here is one scenario. It could be possible by um, disabling the feed water heaters. It could also be possible by opening all feed water valves. Now, just in case you didn't know, before the feed water goes back to the, um, to the, to the heating element, on the reactor side, it, it needs to be heated because when it comes from the condenser, it's too cold. Therefore, it's heated up by feed water heaters. And you see uh, one of those heaters on the screen in the uh, bottom right corner, okay? And um, in a nuclear power plant, you, you don't, not only have one feed water heater, you have a bunch of these. And uh, the, uh, the, overall skin, um, um, the overall design is uh, visualized in the right corner. Okay, now let's take a closer look at what the design control document says. A reduction in feed water temperature may be caused by a low pressure heater train or a high pressure heater train out of service or bypassed. So this is what the design control document takes into consideration and then they prove that the safety design is able to cope with that situation. Now what's the catch here? They are talking about one component that randomly fails. But that's not our scenario for a sophisticated cyber attack. So your cyber attacker would try to fail or to switch off to bypass all feed water heaters at once. And that's not covered by the uh, safety analysis. So that's something that the attacker can work with and certainly the defenders sh should also do that. So the next step in our analysis is to map what I then call critical constraints. So once the, the, the parameters that if exceeded may result in unacceptable consequence. We map those critical constraints to physical dependencies and digital control. And here is how I suggest to do that. In our example, uh, on the uh, upper left corner, you have the reactor core. And I have identified those critical constraints just uh, exemplary by uh, stating, for example, the coolant temperature must not um, must not be cooled down for more than 80 degrees Fahrenheit uh, per time unit. And then I have also added another critical constraint which simply reads uh, the reactor power must stay below 1 or 10 percent. And now what you, what you see on the right is the dependencies. So the, the dependencies on the coolant temperature are, for example, the feed water heaters that I have just discussed earlier, and also the feed water flow valves. Both are controlled by normal process control. They are not controlled by, by the safety system. So by disabling all of the feed water heaters simultaneously, probably also opening all feed water flow valves simultaneously, I have created a condition that's not covered by the accident analysis. Maybe if I want to top it all off, I will also compromise the in-core measurement system because that's where the, the reactor power is measured. Okay? And now the question is, which we don't know because it's outside of the analysis, what's going to happen? Is the safety system able to cope with that situation or not? 
We don't know. But I suggest we better find out rather soon. Because that would be a classical cyber-physical attack scenario, just to put the target out of its design basis. And as you will understand, in a cyber attack, in a cyber-physical attack, this is exactly what the attacker would try to, to do. Okay? Uh, if, if they would succeed, it's game over in a couple of minutes. So worst case, this results in a reactivity accident uh, comparable to what we have seen in Chernobyl. And uh, you won't have time to assemble your blue team. <laughs> no, it won't work. Your incident response will be limited to um, civil defense. And so that's a problem that we need to deal with. The, the uh, attackers will definitely analyze those conditions out of the design basis parameters. And I just hope that the defenders start doing the same rather soon. You could do the same uh, modeling for Stuxnet, just to put it into perspective. This is not limited to nuclear. This is not limited to situations where you need safety systems. So here you find a brief sketch of what happened in Stuxnet. Uh, you have critical constraints of the centrifuge rotors, uh, like the, uh, the pressure must stay below a certain, amount, a certain pressure. Uh, the rotor speeds uh, must stay below uh, uh, the maximum uh, frequency. Uh, you also need to make sure that you don't come across those resonance frequencies uh, rather often. And uh, the, the diagram tells you the dependencies to the physical systems that you need to manipulate in order to make it happen. In our case, uh, in the, in the uh, lower half of the diagram, uh, they had to manipulate the centrifuge isolation valves for the overpressure attack. They also needed to manipulate the stage overpressure valves. And uh, in the blue boxes below those, you see the affected control system. So this is basically straightforward engineering analysis. For the second attack, you see it uh, on, on top with, with the frequency converters, uh, and, and uh, so you would have to manipulate the drive speeds, and in order to uh, make that happen, you would digitally um, uh, co compromise the centrifuge drive system, which was running on, a, on Siemens S7315. Um, last but not least, once that you have now identified all those dependencies and, and the major systems, the major control systems that are in charge. Uh, the, the one thing that's left to do is identify your control options and trust change. Like how, how do I actually, um, how do I penetrate um, that system? What is my best angle to finally sit on those uh, S7 controllers or on, on those uh, controllers of uh, of the feed water heaters, etc. How uh, do I make that happen? Now, here is how I suggest to model that. So, as you see, it's, it's all an exercise in modeling and model driven analysis. For anything cyber physical, consequence is always attached to specific physical objects. And how do we manipulate those? Well, the answer is very simple. We always need to be able to manipulate the actuators. That's what it boils down to, okay?